it's a scary business. We were, we were all just frightened, and that we, we just had to get our teeth and you know, go anyway, you know. And we we got shot up quite a number of times. It's, it's not better than being shot down, I guess. Went overseas on um, February, I don't know exactly, but it was around February 8th or 10th in 1942. And I arrived in England and we had more training and that sort of thing. But we started doing our, t our, our trips on the, our first trip was on October the 3rd, 1944. Yeah, and uh, it was over Germany, bombing Germany, and then we decided to do. Oh, in fact, all together we did 31 trips, uh, all, over, uh, all over Germany. January of 1946, uh, I was drafted drafted into the army. When you go in the army, they give you all sorts of tests, and they said, "Do you know how to type?" I said, "Yeah, I had typing in high school." They gave me a test. I must have made a lot of mistakes because the sergeant said, one thing for sure, you never type for the Army. After basic training, my first assignment was clerk typist. <laughs> I was on a, a destroyer in the, in, the, in the Navy, in the Navy part of my career, tracking Russian submarines. I really joined the Army part of it, but, but I was in all three. I liked the, the ship part. It was on the West Coast, the second destroyer squadron in the West Coast. Like we, went to, we went to Hawaii all the time, Hawaii and Southern California. I think the thing that I've learned most deeply in my military is the importance of obedience. I've never any appointment, I've never challenged that. I've never said, why are you sending me there? I go saying, whatever you tell me to do, I know I'm doing what God wants me to do. And that's, to me, the great benefit of obedience. If things aren't going well, I have a right to ask our Lord, is it, you sent me here, <laughs> I did what you told me to do, help me. And I've always got the help. Every bazillion uh, during the Second World War in North America would have been conscious that the sacrifice that we were making as bazillions um, to allow our men uh, to serve in the military was connecting us in a very special way with our confreres in France uh, because that was very much where the, the center of, um, of the war was. You know, as difficult as it, as it must have been, because we had to keep our apostolates going, I imagine that it wasn't, that there wasn't a great deal of um, reluctance. If bazillions were making a personal decision that they wanted to enlist, I have a feeling that our general counsel was probably saying, well, we want to support you. I think that they would have been uh, inclined to want to be making uh, the sacrifice in solidarity with uh, others who were doing and uh, making the same sacrifice. So this is January 31st, 1945. I would like to have the recent address of our confreres in the service, especially those that may be in England. So far, I haven't had much time for touring, but I did see London when I visited my brother Lewis at his air base north of the big city. At that time, I witnessed three V1s over the city. The people seemed to give no notice to the buzz bombs unless they heard the motor shut off. Then there would be a frantic rush for the air raid shelters. The V2s are more deadly and destructive because there is no sound until they strike. Viewing the famous spots of London, the Parliament buildings, Big Ben, 
Trafalgar Square, Hyde Park, the foggy Thames and surroundings, the tower, etc., brought back memories of the days at St. Mike's and Assumption, studying English prose and poetry. They took on new forms and colors. Well, Father, I would enjoy receiving news of Padres and give them all my best regards, and may God bless you all. Asking a prayer and a memento in your masses, I remain your obedient subject and confer in Christ, John F. Honorato, CSB. Father says, Monday was so cold and bitter that the wine and water actually froze in the chalice. At communion time, it had to be warmed up by my cold hands. This is the first time I've ever witnessed a phenomenon like this in 20 years in the priesthood. The men knelt there bareheaded in the snow, and our divine Savior must often think of the shepherds that first Christmas night as he sees them kneeling there. I wonder if he gets a quiet smile when he watches his priest shivering. Well, he has a real spirit of his vows as Brazilians. You know, and he takes everything to the superior, which I'm really impressed. And yet he's willing to step out in faith and take a risk. And I think that was always the spirit of the Brazilians, like to take a risk to go to Canada and so forth and to start a new, a new uh, college or school. Or, so I think he reflects that Brazilian spirit of adventure and obedience. We never liked the day trips because as you can see it, and because it's kind of dead. But anyway, the day trip, and they focused their guns on us. And we did all kinds of maneuvers. There was one called the corpse crew. But you, you, you go down like that and then climb up and that other direction and so on. And we did that for about 50 to 20 minutes. And then all of a sudden, it stopped. I don't know why. And I never found out. And they stopped shooting, shooting at us. And we were able to drop our bombs and get back home. The fact that has impressed me the most as a chaplain is the grand job that Catholic education has done and is doing for Almighty God and the Church. It has given the world a body of Catholic youth that is a credit to the Church and a pride to their country. The young lads whom Brazilian teachers taught just a couple of years ago are now carrying the bright light of their faith in the midst of the destruction and turmoil of the greatest war in history. They are piloting and manning giant four-engine bombers over enemy territory. Not only is a huge fortune in aircraft under their command, but the lives of their crews are entrusted to them as well. Little did we realize that those mischievous little imps like Frank Kelly, Ted Helm, Bernie Cahill, Jack Ryan, and countless others would be foremost in helping to make this world a fit place to live in. I mention these brave young men because I saw them flying off into the dusk one night. In vain did I wait for the dawn to bring them back. They never returned. To them, the most important part of their flying operations was the reception of the sacraments before takeoff. That is what Catholic education did for these boys. Wherever they are now, and whatever their lot may be, they may have the mantle of God's grace around them. I tell you over and over again that the faith is usually strong when a Catholic is well instructed. How well do I see it in these times of so much danger and of so much death? There was not one, but several members of air crews who have told me that they would not operate unless a chaplain was with them. This statement is extreme, to say the least, but it does reveal a healthy point of view. Two Catholic pilots returned one night from operations. The target was hot, and they had a shaky time of it, and I believe their exploits hit the headlines in Canadian newspapers. Both pilots said to me, Father, prayer alone brought us back. I'm not trying to create the impression that these lads are angels. They are not. They are, on the whole, a good bunch of youngsters. They have bags of goodwill. They need your prayers. We only hope that the war does not leave too many scars on them. As for the chaplains, it is a privilege and an honor 
to be able to do our small share with these brave boys. As ever, Stan Lynch, CSB. There was that sense that I personally had that would look and say, how would I possibly think of the students that I presently teach as having to go to war, uh, to die at age 18, 19, 20, and it's a far cry. Of course, I share the luxury, as do my students, of never having grown up in a war and never having to face those challenges, and it would be brutal. I, the sacrifice that those young men made and the sacrifice that Stan Lynch was making every day was absolutely heroic. On August the 29th, 1944, Bob wrote with the Superior General, Father Edmund Gus McCorkle, we had a rough time at first and went through some real war and it really is hell on earth. All our worries about getting the men to the sacraments have disappeared and all are glad to see me come along. It's remarkable what a few mortars and 88 millimeter shells uh, do to our men. To get closer to my men, I moved out of headquarters to a casualty clearing post. I carry the Blessed Sacrament with me when there's a chance to see my men. I go from tank to tank or carrier to carrier and ask for the Catholics when they're in a stationary place. One weekend, they were continually shelled, so I had to slide into a slit trench with the men a number of times. In one good slip trench, I had a half a dozen men come to me individually for confession and communion. I kept the name so it was a bit of consolation when I had to bury a few of them later in the week. Father Bob Lowry received a military cross for distinguished gallantry in the field. In the citation that accompanied it, Bob's Brigadier General, the highest rank of the three types of general in the Canadian Army, wrote, he has been a tower of strength to his units, not only as a chaplain, but as a man amongst men. That man has done as much, if not more, for the success of this show than any other officer under my command. Father Bob Lowry was a true Brazilian. He didn't fit into any mold. He was simply himself, an extrovert who could strike up a conversation with anyone. This made him an extremely effective chaplain, as his Brigadier General stated. In his experience as chaplain, it seemed that Bob learned that he was extremely gifted in pastoral work. Before the war, Bob was a high school teacher. After the war, he worked in parishes. I can remember seeing him sitting with other Brazilians in his white shirt sleeves on lawn chairs in front of Clover Hill. I had no idea at the time that he was a war hero. To me, he was just a nice old guy who was easy to talk to. Twenty eighth of December, nineteen forty four. The parcel of foodstuffs also came. The oka was a rare delicacy, but I am forced to admit that your favorite cereal already forms a staple feature of our diet. Cheese, tin fruit or juices, and prepared chocolate drinks are very acceptable. Spam, spork, prem, cam, and other monosyllabic tinned meats are already here in too great abundance. We never get fruit juice or tomato juice, so if you can score some, it would be welcome. He ministered in the face of great adversity and war, but he still remained extremely down to earth the entire time and really connected to the community, even though he was miles and miles away. And that's what I really find inspirational.